This is Granules of Grief with Refilwe, a podcast breaking down into digestible pieces the big lump that is grief. For those still struggling with its enormity, those unfamiliar, and even those who found a version of living that is somewhat closer to the aliveness they had before the loss. Thank you for being here. Welcome to part two of my conversation with Retable Masilo, author of the poetry books, Things That Are Silent, Vasla, Guadin, and Letter to Country. Is walking us through his journey of grief. What is it that surprised you about grieving these people that you lost? With Matlati, it's clear that there was a lot going on. There were too many things happening. The fact that we had to plan our own escape from the yes. country, because by then we knew that dad was alive and in Johannesburg. And so we had to plan for our own departure. And we had to think about the animals that we had. Dogs, cats, cows, pigs, mm-hmm. pigeons. Mm-hmm. The house, we're just going to leave the house like that. We're going to lock it and go. And so we we had a lot to think of. And we really had little time to feel sorry for ourselves. I think following the funeral of Madlati, our nephew, the remaining time that we had in Lesotho was spent thinking about how to save our own skins. Exactly. And uh, the pain was still there, of course, but uh, it was in the back of the mind. Um, mm. But once we were across the border, we reunited with dad. Uh, and felt a little better, a little safer, I should mm. say. Uh, but then we were picked up, of course, by the apartheid government um, mm. and thrown in jail, oh. even though it was for 24 hours only. It was a harrowing experience. And uh, a bit of torture was introduced into our sleep in the form of sleep deprivation. Uh, some people were beaten, beaten up uh, for, one, mm. for this reason or that. And so you see that we... We were occupied with other things yeah. beyond survival mode. Survival, yeah. Yeah. And then when we got out of this prison because we didn't have the right papers that mm. every black person in South Africa at the time of apartheid had to have on their person, we, yes, we had to find a way to get out of that country. Mm. Couldn't possibly stay there mm. under those conditions and... So it was all these things. And and finally, when we were in Kenya, we could breathe a little bit in Kenya because uh, we were really far away from um, the PMU people or the Koyoko people oh, yeah. and, and yeah. far away from apartheid as mm-hmm. well. When we were in Kenya, we of course, we knew that Hosofalang or Mbera, as we called him, had left. And so I remember talking with mom and she was saying that When walking down the street, she's looking at people's faces to see if she can see him. When when downtown, she looks at people's faces and under their hats uh, to see if it's not him. And I said, "Wow, mom, I do the same thing." And but of course, he was not there. He was not in Kenya. He had probably already been killed, as evidenced by what we what I discovered in Busana when I yes, met some of time. his friends at that time, yeah, before mm-hmm. leaving Lesotho as a refugee myself. Mm-hmm. His death, I think I said at the beginning, was gradual. It wasn't like the cutting of a neck. It was like he was dismembered little by little. And the pain of losing him increased with the passing of time because mm-hmm. we realized little by little that he was We'll never see him again until that fateful day when the letter came and said, he's Mm -hmm. gone. And I was in America at the time. And and I remember sitting on a balcony in one of the dorms where I was and uh, just weeping Mm -hmm. on the balcony and sitting at a small table and weeping, weeping, and and then putting on Marvin Gaye. (laughs) I don't know why. (laughs) Music. Yes, uh, mm-hmm. let's get it on. <laughs> it's funny because you had mm-hmm. this 
I had just had this news and was mourning for my brother. We, yeah. And then afterwards, I put Marvin Gaye and tried to forget. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Thinking you could forget at that time. Thinking that I could forget, yes. And yes. not knowing, I guess, what lay ahead in terms of. Yeah. The final stab, I think. Uh, because it was, uh, it's difficult to describe. It it started, if you imagine a graph, mm-hmm. I'm a bit of a scientist on the side. I actually yes. studied science. And you have the, you have a graph and you have the X axis and the Y axis. Um, and it's a simple graph where Y axis is, is time in, or years rather. And, and, the, and the other one is time. Mm-hmm. And, or rather, the one that goes up, the x-axis, is the amount of pain you have suffered. And the other one is time. It started at zero, of course, for my brother. And then it gradually went up. As we were attacked, we left. We came to the realization that he's dead. And the letter came. That was the zenith. And then it went down. because, But gradually. So it's something like... A, a bump, a hill. Mm. It goes up, it reaches the top where it was the most painful when we were 100% sure that he was dead because it had been confirmed officially. And then it was going down the other side of the hill gradually because we were not, we didn't have his body. We didn't know how he died. We didn't have his body. And our minds were not letting go. Mm. And I think for me, it came back to almost zero because it will never go back to zero. When a ceremony was held after my parents had gone back to Lesotho and things were almost normal politically and they were home and they held the ceremony for him, um, they changed the headstone of our nephew and included his name. So on the left, it was the little boy. And it is because the headstone is still the same. It says, Mutlatsi yes. Masilo, um, born this year and died this year. And on the right side, it says, Khotsafala Masilo, born this year and died, question mark. Um, because we do not have the date and we never had the body. Uh, that, which is why it'll never go to zero. No. It'll never, I can say with certainty that although I still feel pain for my nephew. Mm. I know he's gone for sure. There has been closure. Uh, but for Khotsafalang, the, there is a small window open and I'm still waiting. Perhaps one of his friends will fill in the gaps. Mm. Fill in the detail. How did he die? And so on. So grieving for these two was different. Mm. The young one was sudden. Mm. A stab. Mm. Uh, and for my brother, it was like a rash increasing mm-hmm. and, until your skin was burning because mm-hmm. of this rash. And then somehow you got a little ointment that was put on it and it became less and less, but it'll never go. And I never, I never prevented myself from uh, either thinking about them or crying when I was alone or when I was writing, especially the book Vaslap, but all of the books that I have written, when a poem particularly touched me, I wept. I wept on the computer. And I wept for two reasons. Because it was like squeezing my own heart with my own hand. Uh, But also it was because I had put down on paper my feelings exactly. And reading myself made me cry because it was what was hurting me. And I had succeeded in transferring it to paper. So I never really backed away from hurting myself. Yes. But I never also never decided that I was going to hurt myself. I would just write a poem and start feeling that it's taking form and this is painful. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, and the the poem about Mutlati was one such poem where I knew I was onto something and I wasn't about to stop hurting myself, because if I stopped hurting myself, then I wouldn't write that poem. Yes. And there are several poems about about him, about Khotsofalang. 
And I remember writing, I was in the midst of writing a poem for him. And it does say so for my brother, Jose Fallon, or something like that. And as I was driving around Paris, there's this beltway or ring road. So I was on it. And in the distance, I saw a tree against the horizon, against the sky. Mm -hmm. And it just seemed, it, it looked like a hand. And I imagined that the hand was reaching up to grab God by his lapels. And the poem was in my head living rent free in my head and so mm. <laughs> every everything that i saw that could be related to that was mm. and so that line is in the poem and and it hurt because, uh, because i wanted to hold god by his lapels and mm. <laughs> say what what the hell you know how dare you what, how dare you do this uh, <laughs> for an obscure reason that we still don't understand. We know it was to kill dad, but why did you let him die, the young boy? And, and oh, no, it's so loaded. I think it's a process that sometimes requires specific people in a specific profession to, I don't want to say shrinks, but there must be some professionals who are qualified in dealing with those who are grieving. Mm. I never had to deal with such kind of professionals. Maybe that's why it took such a long time. Maybe that's mm. why. But I went into it with both feet and in at the deep end. I think grieving is natural part of life yes, and we can't run away from it. No. I think it actually hurts more when we try to ignore it or run away from it. So I would advise anyone really Mm. to face it head on and in so doing help themselves. And the act of doing something on the side does help. Yes. Thank you so much. This is a a loaded, loaded portion because you've touched on so many things. Mm. I do have a Mm. question where the letter came from that told you about Khotsofalang. Demise, yes. It came from one of the cadres, one of the people in the committee of the BCP in exile, Mm. the Basutu Congress Party in exile. I will never remember who had signed the letter because I think maybe I was told, but that wasn't important at the time. I don't remember if, yes, after this letter, my my parents, my two younger brothers went to Botswana for the first ceremony of Hotsofalan's death. I was in the States with yes. my younger sister and I sent my passport to the embassy of Botswana in the U.S. to get a visa. Uh, and they forgot to send it back. So I wasn't able to go. Mm. But uh, some of my friends had gone from Lesotho to Botswana because I was supposed to have gone. And so they were there. And it was unfortunate for me and for them that one, so, one of them is Japan, who's mm. quite a famous character, I would say. That, that well, is Japan. We did the Japan at Foreign Affairs. We did some protocol work. Oh, you did? Yes. He yeah. went to Botswana yes. too. To oh, see nice. me and uh, participate. Mm-hmm. Uh, we grew up together. I think uh, almost from the womb, we, we were together. We went to the mm-hmm. same primary school, mm-hmm. the same high school, the same mm-hmm. university. We, we were in the same dormitory. <laughs> we went to Null together, the, the National University of Lesotho. what you said about counseling a lot of people talk about the importance of getting therapy to deal with these things and that even as we suggest all these beautiful things that people can do to cope they don't replace therapy and 
sometimes mm. people mm. find help and they find it quicker in, yes. in therapy. And also therapy does not replace all these other things that we do to commemorate, to oh, celebrate, no. to connect. It's and one big whole thing. Exactly. We're not asking people to be poets. You are a poet. Other people do other things. Yes. I think it's about finding the best way to connect to exactly. the people who have exactly. departed. When you lose, I lost a lot of, almost everyone that I love yeah. deeply mm. is now no longer on this earth. Yes. There's no way that my life will not be a reflection of that. And that's mm. something that I think people who don't understand, my life will be a reflection in my tastes, my mm. even in my parenting. And of I course. think you, you bring up all these important things that I just wanted to recognize mm. and to mm. add mm. to. You've also talked a lot about how grief comes to us almost mm -hmm. daily at any point without warning. There you were without driving warning, yes. and suddenly yeah. I, yeah. I've really... As I always hope to do, I am learning and being reminded. Did any part of your grieving include guilt? Asking this question, particularly in relation to Mbera and the fact that you had information that your parents right. didn't know he was going to leave. Yeah. Bluntly, <laughs> no. And I think that might have been helped by the fact that my parents didn't try to put any blame on, on me for not telling them of his plans to leave, knowing that I told my parents many years afterward. Uh, it didn't seem important to me to let them know that I had known that, you had known. that he was leaving. But there, there was no guilt of any sort. Why? Because I think that um, I couldn't have stopped it. Mm -hmm. I think that if I had told my parents the night before, they would have talked to him, maybe, but they wouldn't have handcuffed him. I don't think there was anything they could have done. Mm. But the most important part of the lack of guilt is that after they had left and gone to Botswana and word came back of where they were, some parents went to get their children back. Mm. But my parents said, ah, no. He wants to do it. He wants to fight for his own country. Mm. So they never made the move to go and bring him back. Mm. And that, I think, also helped me, took a load off mm. me. And also, I think I would have done it. You I think would. I would have done it if he had let me. I would have uh -huh. without, because we had, we, we had suffered under mm -hmm. the government. We had lost a lot. We had, we were getting clothes sent to us from the U.S. by, mm -hmm. by dad's old teacher. So, yeah. And uh, so there was really no guilt. Mm -hmm. There was really no guilt. And uh, I don't know how I could have managed to team up guilt and grief. That would have been the most, one of the most difficult things to, <laughs> to have to yeah. deal with. But then my brother, my brother wasn't sick. He was a young adult, very promising. He was the head of the family because mm -hmm. he was the first boy. Yeah. So there was a lot to grieve for in, in, in that way. Mm -hmm. I was promoted. Uh, <laughs> the to be, promotion you wouldn't have applied for. No, mm -hmm. that I didn't particularly want to, mm -hmm. to be accorded. But there, there it is. I was the oldest boy suddenly. And... So after we came back from exile, uh, I'm getting old, so I'm trying to remember when my parents got back. Mm -hmm. It might have been 94, something like that, 1994. And dad suddenly took ill. And uh, they went back from Nairobi to Lesotho around 94? Around 94, yes. Okay. I was in France yeah. or at that time. I got to France in 87 with... Uh, the current Mrs. Masilo and first, the current and the only Mrs. Masilo did come to France because of her, because we were both at the same university in the States. And we fell in love, yes. Mm -hmm. and, and we fell in love. Mm -hmm. She wasn't able to resist me. <laughs> <laughs> I think she would say the same thing. You were not able to Probably. resist her. <laughs> Probably. Probably. <laughs> Oh, 
<laughs> when dad took ill, I was driving from work and I was on the highway and, and I answered the phone and he said, and he was completely lucid. He said, you have to come home, son. Oh, really, dad, why? Just come home. I, I'm at the clinic, something like that. Or oh, I'm going to the clinic and I wanted to come home. Remember, I'm the head of the family yes. at this stage. And, and I think I left in about a week because I had to talk to my clients. As I'm a freelancer, I have direct uh, clients. Mm. Uh, but when I got to to Bloemfontein, th- there was a, a welcoming committee waiting for me. Mm. Mom, my brothers. Mm. There was in Tatilinka. Mm. Japan was there, and my uncle was there. My my dad's younger brother. Who else was there? And we got into the cars and drove to the clinic. Mm-hmm. And dad, who had been lucid and intelligible a week before, suddenly wasn't able to speak. He had tubes mm-hmm. in his nose. Um, mm-hmm. And apparently the problem was that he had water in his lungs. And so periodically they would come and pump it out. And he had this awful face of pain whenever they mm-hmm. did that. And I guess he knew that he was terminally ill Mm. that's why he asked me to come home yes and i remember being alone with him in the room i was holding his hand and he he made an incredible effort to lift my hand and put it uh, on the tubes on his face and i just broke down crying because i understood that he's asking me to let him go take these things out of my nose and i just i was crying i went out and called my wife and talked to her and and so the um, wasn't sudden because he was he was seventy nine. He was seventy nine. Yes. He wasn't ninety nine or a hundred. Yes. And he had been ill for a while. He had a stroke. So it wasn't that sudden, but it was sudden because I flew from Paris and then found him in that situation. And so what happened with dad was that we would go back to Maseru and then the next day go to Bloemfontein to the clinic and I had my ticket to come back to Paris. I had my plane ticket. And so the last night um, before my departure, there was a party for me. And during the party, the telephone rang and it was the clinic. He's gone. Yeah. Letting us know that he's gone. And so my brother and I drove to Bloemfontein in the middle of the night mm. because they told us how much it would cost to keep him at the clinic mm-hmm. until the following day. Mm-hmm. And we decided it's cheaper to just go and get it. We <laughs> called the morgue the and, of and, the night. Uh, and the morgue followed us and we drove. We were both drunk, of course. We got him and came back with him. My dad had a huge funeral that was held at much mm-hmm. because there were so many people. The king was there, the ministers. And I think I read a poem or two. Yes. I don't remember. Yes. And, uh, I was, it hit me very hard. And the reason I say that is because my my father had never been my friend. Mm. He was harsh and stern. And he was an African father, a Musutu father, perhaps. Yeah. He never played with us. He rarely joked with us. And just before, the last time I saw him, before he got sick before he called me and said, come home. Mm. He was already sick. He had a stroke and he was a changed man. Mm. He was my father. He Mm. was the father. I wish I had all these years. He was kind. He was jovial. He smiled. And when I left, the last time I saw him on his feet, he was holding my hands and looking me in the eye and saying, I hope you come back with your children because I was there with my wife and kids. Oh, and uh, and I realized after his death mm-hmm. what we had lost. Yes. This kind man, this smiling person that I could have been friends with, yes. but I was only friends with in the space of a few months. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's why I think his death hit me harder than my mother's death whom I loved beyond reason even. Mm. 
But she had always been with us. She had always loved us. My father loved us, I'm sure. Mm, But mom had shown it with words and with actions. And Mm -hmm. she had played with us on Saturday mornings. She had done everything possible (laughs) to make sure that we had everything we needed. Mm -hmm. She had taught us how to be human. Driving one day, just to give you a short anecdote of how, what kind of person she was, mm-hmm. driving with her, Kingsway, the main street in town, going home to Kwading with mm-hmm. uh, provisions for our convenience store. Mm-hmm. We passed this woman on the pavement mm-hmm. who was selling potatoes. And we passed her and then mom stopped the car and backed up and gave me money to buy some potatoes. And I tried to protest that we had bags of potatoes in the Mm -hmm. car and she said go go and get the potatoes Mm -hmm. when i came back she explained in in so many words that this woman it's late Mm -hmm. so it's 5 p.m or 6 p.m i don't remember it's visibly going to rain and this woman is still sitting there she hasn't sold anything and by buying her potatoes maybe she can buy a piece of meat so her Mm -hmm. family can have potatoes and meat yes And so she was this kind of person who had a a empathy for, uh, I don't want to say for the underdog, but for for people who were less fortunate Mm -hmm. than she was. And I remember sitting with her Mm -hmm. on the veranda because now we lived in Lower Tits. And I was sitting on the veranda with her, which I did a lot. And a woman came to the gate and she was at the gate and the greeted each other, Dumela and Le Pelajong and so on. Um Kupa mm. uh, this lady said, I'm looking for a job. Mm. Looking for work. Mm. And mom stood up and approached her and she talked to her in such kind terms, calling her my sister, because she already had someone and she couldn't give her a job. But she was talking to her in such a way that the other lady would feel she comforted that Mm-hmm. If there was a possibility, she would have given me a job. So she was this kind of person. The boy who, a young boy who was married and had a child, who would come to the gate later in life, mom was aging, and sp- spill his guts out about how he needs paraffin mm-hmm. in order to cook for his child, and but he doesn't have any money. And so mom would give him a little money. Her death was painful, but I was... Relief is not the right word. Mm -hmm. Uh, She was ill. When my sister called me in France and told me mom had passed, I dropped the phone, went to the bathroom, locked myself in Mm -hmm. and wept like a child. Yes. But that was it. I got it out and then I called her and asked for the details. Mm -hmm. Um, Dad, it was different. It was longer because Mm -hmm. I I hadn't known him. I think for us, who are still alive, every day is an opportunity to be mm-hmm. the best version of ourselves, to always remember that we are tomorrow's deceased. You know, how you're living your life now really will define how you will be grieved. And I wish many people had this lesson before because I think they would have been different. I want you to make sure that <laughs> you talk about the vast love, like I promised at the beginning. Ah, yes. <laughs> the vast love that traveled and traveled. To Paris, the vast lab, which became the <laughs> title of my second book. Yes, a very painful book to write. Poems in it uh, about my father, my brother, yeah. my nephew. Mm-hmm. And it was so painful to write, mm-hmm. but I think so true to, I was able to put my feelings down on paper. Yes. Because in 2016, the book won the Glenn Luche Prize for African Poetry. Yay! And it was a great honor, really. Mm -hmm. And after that prize, I was invited to Poetry Africa, the poetry festival, which is held in Durban. I remember seeing you around that time on SABC, actually. Yeah, that morning show. I remember (laughs) feeling extremely proud to be Ah, able to call you Motuale Soto and hoping that all aspiring poets can get to experience you and to know that we are capable. Thank you very much. I have to really thank you for for inviting me to share these with you and to hear what you have to say about grieving. It, it was an honor. Thank you. What to 
to you if it's just one thing. Should people not say or not do mm-hmm. when somebody is grieving? I think that I think that help from others should not be forced, should not be is forced the right word, mm-hmm. imposed. Imposed. And I think that a little word here and there is enough. Yeah. And that the one who is grieving should be left alone to ask for help if they need it. Mm. Instead of forcing them to go, let's go and see this movie because yes. let's do this, let's do yes. that. A nice, good and firm hug, a pat on the mm-hmm. back. I find that when my parents passed, that was the thing that did it for me. Uh, because then when they passed, um, except for mom, because there was COVID when mom passed and I mm-hmm. never got to go. Definitely. But when dad passed, there, there was family and friends and, uh, and they were the same. They, they were the same. Yes. They did say my condolences. Yes. But then they were the same. They were their own selves. And many of them will just really just come, um, have the meal, and, and be like nothing has happened. <laughs> I'm not moping yeah. or anything Thank like that. They were there. That Thank is you. the attitude, I think, the right attitude to mm-hmm. take. I wanted to ask you if there was anything you would there's anything you don't find helpful that people who've never grieved will say or do? I think for me, in my experience, one of the worst things that I have ever been told was, um, it was a long time ago, let it go. You know, that makes me upset. Um, as if the person who left was a pair of shoes and they're used and so I think instead of saying something like that, people should just not say anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that amongst our people, grieving is not taken like it is in the West. I mean, we're supposed to be tough, right? And and so people will come to the funeral, but very few people will come directly to to talk to you. I think that what I found helpful in the people who did that was mostly in the West, really. Those who came toward me when they found out about my story, especially when it was still fresh, and hugged me. Not for a second, but for a minute or more. Uh, and you just built into them. Uh, many times uh, the tears come, but that's liberating as well. And uh, so, so I wish, I wish um, more of us could learn to hug when when I was in certain states, um, I just wanted to cry and to to be left alone to do it. So this, I hope this helps people in some way. And I think that Thank is you. a great note to end on to say, what may not be apparent to people who haven't grieved is that big bang, that big loss, that yeah. big, a whole human being was here and mm. now in their place is nothing. And there's no way you can continue to be the same. Even though the ways we're different are different, you know, we go, we become different in different ways, but there's no way that there people no way. Can, can, can go on as before. Yes, yes. The anniversaries of the day, are they? No, in- not at okay. all. No, I don't, I don't celebrate their birthdays, uh-huh. nor no the dates of their passing. I have them in my calendar, but I'll just look at them. We put up a poem about mm-hmm. them or something mm-hmm. like that, but no sadness. And there's no, no structure to it. Not really. Which really speaks to the subjective nature of grief. And I'm so glad that I, I think it does. We, yes, it really does, because a lot of people will do that. And I'm also glad that you mentioned this thing around let's not let's not force the bereaved to or the mm. grieving to do something. But at yes. the same time, yes. I think you also spoke about something that was very some people say that it was unique to me that I knew my grief was my own and I was ready to bear it on my own. And so there wasn't a lot of judgment over how Mm -hmm. people were showing Mm -hmm. up for me because I knew that nothing was going to take away from how much I had to suffer. Thank you. I'm really grateful because it was a very interesting discussion that we had. This topic that you had chosen is ultra important. So I thank you for that. I was very much interested in seeing what 
in an artistic way what you were coming up with and and i hope it's going to continue <laughs> i'm just so grateful i feel like these conversations are helpful that how we live our lives is ultimately how we're going to be grieved thank you you've given me many hours from the lives <laughs> of your children and your, your with pleasure really. wonderful caring wife and I will always be grateful. This is going to be, for me, I hope, a podcast mm. that people will find because they need it. In the, I hope it helps someone. Exactly. In the throes yeah. of my despair, mm. I needed to hear people talk about going down and coming up. I needed to hear yeah. all that talk, all the scientific talk about growth. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes. So this is the kind of space I'm hoping to create for anyone who needs it. And I want to thank mm -hmm. you. I have no words. You know how how The feeling hard. is mutual, really. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I told you I wasn't going to let you go without saying two of your poems. Uh -huh. The first poem is called The Horses. In its The Horses, I think I don't like to introduce my poems, but I had written about my situation and the night that the attack happened so much that I don't know how my brain works, but it told me to write a poem like the one that I'm about to read in order to experience and try to explain the same situation. The Horses. Those people did come in buckies, four, perhaps, out of the West. When one of the men came over and touched our manes with his hand, our mother rippled. We had been taught to never nay. When one fine day a neighbor beat us for eating his best beets and lettuces, even then we only bit our lips and let air ruffle our hair in his face while he struck. But these men here spoke a language we didn't know. Father stood on his hind legs and bared his teeth at them. And even at that dark hour, with the stars watching, mother walked over to our youngest, swished flies off his face with her tail, then spun around to face those men again. No one neighed, not even when the shooting began. The second poem that I'm going to read is called My Mother's Calendar. My Mother's Calendar. We have learned to abide by our mother's language and by her calendar when we are in her presence. Every time she mentions him, it's to relate a part of life to the years when he was with us. Old has become when your father was alive. And some of us have begun to speak her way too, the same way we began to love people after observing her. Now is since he died. And even we hear what she does not dare say and left me behind. Our mother looks like her mother and my sisters look like her. The boys in my family all look like each other and yearn to take after him. In the future, or soon, is fast becoming the day I am with your father and you are free at last. Even though she set us free at birth, just after she had handed each of us to the midwife for cleaning and we had been returned to her arms for the first breakfast of our lives. Thank you for spending time on this episode of Granules of Grief with Refil. I do hope that you got even just a granule of what you need. You can find more information on the podcast on my social media profiles on Instagram at Refil Litokot and Refil Litokot on my Facebook page as outlined in the description box. 
I hope to see you there too.